With respect to the fourth, we may consult Nehemiah in Nehemiah 13, verses 15 and 19, when the people about Jerusalem engaged about secular employment, bearing burdens and trafficking out and in the city. He expostulates with them, shuts the gate of the city, and sets his servants to see that no burdens be brought in on the Sabbath. And in the 21st verse, he testifies against the merchants who lodged about the gate and wall, saying, quote, Why lodge ye about the wall? If you do so again, I will lay hands on you. Unquote. Here we have an approved example for punishing the obstinate violators of the Holy Sabbath. Thus the breakers of all the precepts of the first table are punishable by civil pains. I cannot here omit quoting the following paragraph from Gillespie's miscellaneous questions. Quote, Is not, says he, the mischief of a blind guide greater than if he acted treason? Unquote. And the loss of one soul by seduction greater mischief than if he blew up parliament, cut the throat of kings or emperors? So precious is that invaluable jewel of a soul. And, says he, when the church of Christ sinketh in a state, let not that state think to swim. Religion and righteousness flourish and fade, stand or fall together. They who are false to God will never prove faithful to men. Unquote. Eighth, he hath a right to judge of the degrees decrees, excuse me, of ecclesiastical assemblies, whether they are agreeable to the law of God, the supreme law of the land. First Thessalonians 5, verse 12. The command to, quote, prove all things, unquote, is obligatory on the magistrate as well as others. He also is bound to use the rule of unerring rectitude. Isaiah 8, verse 20, quote, To the law and the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them, unquote. Before he gives his sanction to any church deed, he must bring it to this sacred touchstone. If it agrees therewith, he ought to ratify it. If not, he has not only a right to reject it, but he is also bound to stamp his negative upon it. This ratification of it is solely civil, and similar to his sanctioning of civil ordinances. If this power is denied him, he must be considered as being no discretion as being of no discretion and consequently unfit to be a civil magistrate to suppose him bound to ratify whatever the church might decree without previous examination and conviction of its propriety would make him a mere tool fit for nothing but propping up the crazy chair of the man of sin but as we have endeavored to show what the civil power ought to do for the church it will be necessary in the fifth place to show what is the character of the civil branch from which this is to be expected. And, number one, it should possess wisdom and understanding. Exodus 18, verse 21, quote, Moreover, thou shalt provide out of all the men able men, unquote. In Deuteronomy 1, verse 13, quote, Take ye wise men and understanding, and make them rulers over you, unquote. They must be men of ability, possessing wisdom and prudence, and well acquainted with the laws of the Most High God. Thus it is that, quote, wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability, unquote, of their administration. Isaiah 33, verse 6. And without this, there can be no reasonable expectation that they will answer the ends of their appointment. Number two, another part of their character is a profession of Christianity. For a Christian people to appoint a deist to govern them, to say nothing of its repugnancy to the divine law, is even shameful. It is just like the trees in Jotham's parable. Judges 9, verse 14, quote, Then said all the trees unto the bramble, Come thou and reign over us, unquote, because they could not find a tree of more generous growth to govern them. But this is contrary to the express command of God. Deuteronomy 17, verse 15, quote, Thou shalt in any wise set him king over thee, whom the Lord thy God shall choose. One from among thy brethren shalt thou set king over thee. Thou mayest not set a stranger over thee, which is not thy brother. Unquote. Is it to be expected that the man who is not a brother in the profession of the religion of Jesus, but an obstinate infidel, will make his administration to bend to the interests of Emmanuel, whose existence he denies, whose religion he mocks, and whose kingdom he believes to be fictitious? Number three. Another character is uprightness and integrity. Exodus 18.21 here we are informed that they should quote uh, they should be quote such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness unquote. 
The high responsibility connected with their station requires men of rectitude and integrity of character. Thus, 2 Samuel 23, verses 2 and 3. Quote, the Spirit of the Lord spake by me, and his word was in my tongue. He that ruleth over men must be just, ruling in the fear of God. Unquote. Number four, they must be a terror to evildoers. Romans 13, verses 3 and 5. Quote, For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. The ministers of God, avengers to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Unquote. Hence we are informed, quote, He beareth not the sword in vain. Unquote. Suppressing as far as his influence can extend every violation of the divine law. And number five, they must be a, quote, praise to them that do well, unquote. 1 Peter 2, verse 14. Rewarding and encouraging the virtuous, quote, that they may live quiet and peaceable lives in all godliness and honesty, unquote. Solomon's administration is represented as being of this description, Psalm 72, verse 7, quote, In his days shall the righteous flourish and possess abundance of peace." Unquote. Number six, they should be continually attentive to official duty. Romans 13, verse six, quote, for they are God's ministers, attending continually upon this very thing. Unquote. If this were duly attended to, not only would magistratical func functions be better executed, but the absurdity of Erastianism would at once appear. The church functionary is also commanded to attend continually to this department, 1 Timothy 4, verse 15, quote, Give thyself wholly to them, unquote. Of course, some are provided exclusively of the civil magistrate, whose business it is to manage ecclesiastical concerns. But if this also is formally the magistrate's official duty, why should others belonging to another department be appointed? Farther, how could the magistrate attend continually upon this very thing, that is, his own official duty, which is purely civil, and at the same time attend to another concern which is not civil. Common sense teaches that if he attend continually upon one, the other will of course be neglected. Number seven, the civil magistrate should be a keeper of both tables of the law of God. Deuteronomy 17, verses 18 and 19, quote, And it shall be, when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom, that he shall write him a copy of the law in a book, out of that which is before the priests, the Levites. And it shall be with him, and he shall read therein all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, to keep all the words of this law and these statutes, to do them." Unquote. How can he be God's minister if he be regardless of his law? And where can he find such a constitution as that provided for him by the spirit of infinite wisdom? By this he is indispensably bound in his official capacity as well as his subjects are in their private individual capacity. But as we have been endeavoring to characterize the civil branch from which protection to the church excuse me from which protection to the church may be expected it will be proper in the sixth place to characterize the ecclesiastical branch which is of right entitled to this protection and number 1 her constitution should be agreeable to and founded on the word of god hebrews 8 verse 5 quote, see says god thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount unquote. This suits every possible purpose of edification. 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17. Quote, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfectly, uh, that the man of God may, may be perfect, thoroughly furnished into all good works. Unquote. Number two. Her officers should be regularly introduced to ministerial functions by the presbyterial imposition of hands. 1 Timothy 4, verse 14, quote, Neglect not the gift that is in thee by prophecy and the laying on of the hands of the presbytery, unquote. The awful catastrophe of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram should be viewed as a beacon to all, who, by their ambitious dispositions, would be in danger of splitting on this tremendous rock. Christ denominates those who come not in by the door, quote, thieves and robbers. Unquote. And in Matthew 7, verse 15, commands us to, quote, Beware of false prophets who come to us in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravening wolves. Unquote. Let none expect a prophet by their ministrations. Quote, I have not sent them, saith the Lord, yet they ran. Therefore they shall not profit the people. Unquote. Number three. She should, quote, con contend earnestly for the faith once delivered to the saints. Unquote. Jude 3 and 1 Timothy 
6, verse 20, quote, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy care, unquote. In doing this, as with faces of flint and brows of brass, they should be explicit, bold, and valiant, whether the generation unto which they are sent will hear or forbear. There is no neutrality in Christ's service, Judges 5, verse 23, quote, Curse ye, Meraz, saith the angel of the Lord. Curse ye bitterly the inhabitants thereof, because they came not up to the help of the Lord, to the help of the Lord against the mighty, unquote. The very light of nature suggests the prop propriety of being plain and explicit with our brethren of mankind. Should we see our neighbor in danger of falling into a pit, where destruction would be inevitable? Would we not violate the natural laws of humanity if we did not warn him of his danger? Nay, would we not to a certain degree be considered by the divine law as accessory to his ruin? Of infinitely more importance is the salvation of the soul. Says our Lord, quote, What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Unquote. To faithful testimony bearing, the following things are necessary. First, a just summary and clear statement of the truths contained in the sacred oracles. Secondly, a clear refutation of the opposite errors, and especially those that unhinge the present truth or word of Christ's patience. And third, a life and conversation becoming the gospel, without which the other two are only a burlesque upon the religion of Jesus.